Hello everyone, I'm Manchu Vastani from Department of Mechanical Engineering and I'm here to discuss with you on a subject Material Science. Subject code is ME207, unit number 5, section number 35 and today's topic are Nano Engineering Materials, Nano Wires, Nano Cones and Sign and Pressure Test in Material Testing. So, the learning objective for today's lecture are to provide the students with a basic understanding of Nano Engineering Materials, Nano Wires, nano cones tensile compressor test in material testing and learning outcome of today's lecture will be students have learned the basics of nano engineered materials nano wires nano cones tensile compressor test that is in material testing and students have understood nano engineered materials in detail so our topic for let's have the topic nano engineered materials See, general procedure to understand the chemistry and physics of materials has been studying large and complex structures. Okay. And then to investigate the fundamental building blocks of these structures that are say, smaller and simpler. So, this approach is sometimes termed as top down science. See, uh, you know that there are various uh, materials available. Okay. And the research is involved uh, to understand the chemistry and the physics of all materials okay so to investigate the fundamental uh, building blocks of these structures that are smaller and simpler and this approach is sometimes termed as top-down science okay so with the advent of scanning probes microscopes which permits the observation of individual atoms and molecules it has become possible to manipulate and move atoms and molecules to form new structures and design new materials that are built from simple atomic level constituents that is material by design okay you can see in this diagram also how they have shown this nano architecture materials like nano wires nano tubes nano fibers and carbide derived carbon okay and this ability to carefully Arrange atoms provides opportunities to develop mechanical, electrical, magnetic, and other properties that are not otherwise possible. So we call this the bottom-up approach. What do you call this? We call this as bottom -up approach. And a study of the properties of these materials is termed as nanotechnology. Okay, the study of these materials. Uh, the study of the properties of these materials is known as nanotechnology. The study of properties of these materials is known as nanotechnology. And the nano prefix denotes that the dimensions of these structural entities are on the order of a nanometer. That is 10 raised to the 10 to the power minus 9 meters. As a rule, less than 100 nanometers. Okay, that is, that is equivalent to approximately 500 diameters. Okay, so they have said about this that the ability to carefully arrange at, uh, atoms provide opportunities to develop some electrical and mechanical and magnetic and other properties that are not otherwise possible. So we call this as bottom up approach, and the study of the properties of these materials is termed as nanotechnology. Okay, so an example of the material of this type is the carbon nanotubes. What they say? Example is carbon nanotubes. In the future, and now undoubtedly, you will find that interestingly, more of a technological advances which will utilize these nano engineered materials. Okay, so nano structural materials will be maybe defined as those materials whose structural element clusters, crystallized crystallites or molecules, have dimensions in the 1 to 100 nanometer range okay now clusters of atoms okay clusters of atoms when you say clusters of atoms consisting of typically hundreds to thousands of nanometer scale what they say clusters of atoms consisting of typically hundreds to thousands on nanometer scale are commonly called as nano clusters so these small groups of atoms in general go by different names such as substantial work. Okay, they carried out in the domain of 
nanostructured materials and nanotubes in the past 25 years. So the explosion in both academic and industrial interest in these nanomaterials over the past decade arises from the remarkable variation in fundamental electrical and optical and magnetic properties that occur as one progresses from an infinitely extended solid to a particle of material what solid to a particle of material consisting of a countable number of atoms okay so nano structured materials has led to a new basic science phenomena and several applications for the short medium and long term okay you can see this the design in the diagram in the bottom diagram okay it's very interesting now application examples like nano electric devices quantum wires electron field emitters okay quantum wires electron field emitters ultra thin screen tv screens nano probes high resolution tips for scanning and atomic force microscopes sensors ultra high strength composites gas storage nano devices parts of nano machines amongst others so carbon based nano materials and nano structures what carbon based nano materials and nano structures including fluorescences and nanotubes these play an interestingly persuasive role in nanoscale science and technology so carbon nanotubes are currently being studied in an effort to understand their novel structure electronic and mechanical properties to explore the immense potential for many applications in nano electronics such as as actuators and sensors what they say the carbon nanotubes okay are currently being studied in an effort to understand their novel structural and electronic and mechanical properties to explore their immense potential for many applications in nano electronics such as actuators and sensors fluorescences and carbon nanotubes can be seen as curved pieces of graphite so graphite is another molecule of carbon okay so you can understand the importance of carbon nanotubes and its importance in the future okay and its potential that can, that can be used in many applications in nano electronics okay let's like discuss about the graphite in detail because they have they say that graphite is another polymorph of you can say carbon a graphite a graphite has a structure carbon crystal structure distinctly different from that of a diamond and is also more stable than diamond at ambient temperature and pressure so graphite is formed by flat hexagonal layers of carbon atom separated by 3.3 or angstrom physically its stiffness along the plane is quite large because of strong sigma bonds and in the perpendicular direction it is weak because of the van der waals forces okay in particular perpendicular direction it is weak because of such kind of van der waals forces now the graphite structure is composed of layers of hexagonally arranged carbon atom you can see this in the figure okay how it is shown that this graphite structure is composed of layers of hexagonally arranged carbon atoms within the layers at each carbon atom is bonded to three coplanar neighbor atoms by strong covalent bonds okay the main thing is that this graphite structure is composed of layers of hexagonally arranged hexagonally arranged carbon atoms okay now within the layers and each this carbon atom is bonded to three coplanar neighbor atoms by strong covalent bonds okay as a consequence of these weak interplanar bonds this interplanar cleavage is a sign which gives us rise to the excellent lubricative properties of graphite what we say due to this weak interplanar bonds it gives rise to a excellent lubricative properties of graphite also the electrical connectivity is relatively high in crystallographic directions parallel to the hexagonal sheets so graphite has the metallic conductivity along the plane and semiconductive perpendicular to the plane and say this graphite has 
metal conductivity along the plane and semiconducting perpendicular to the plane. So other desirable properties of graphite is include high strength, good chemical stability at elevated temperatures and in non-oxidizing atmospheres, high thermal conductivity, low coefficient of thermal expansion, high resistance to thermal shocks, high absorption of gases and good machinability. You can see this graphite has number of uh, you know say good properties to other properties okay among them like high thermal conductivity high resistance to thermal shock high absorption of gases good machinability which has which makes it useful in the industry a graphite is commonly used in heating elements for electric furnaces as electrodes for ac welding in metallurgical crucibles in casting molds for metal alloys and ceramics what in casting molds for metal alloys and ceramics for high temperature refractories and insulations in rocket nozzles in chemical reactor vessels for electrical contacts brushes resistors in casting molds for metal and alloys and ceramics as electrodes in batteries and air purification devices you can see the vast applications of their fight in the industry, ranging from casting molds, ranging from welding, ranging from refractories, ranging from chemical reactor vessels, from brushes, registers, electrodes, air protection devices. You can understand this is a widely used material. So there are other layered materials which can also acquire curvature to generate new nanomaterials with novel applications. What are other types of nanostructured materials which has been considered for applications in optoelectronic devices and quantum optic devices are nano sized powders of silicon, silicon nitride, silicon carbide, and other thin films. Okay, some of these nanomaterials, example like silicon carbide and silicon nitride, you can short from as SIC and SIN are also used as advanced ceramics with controlled microstructures because the strength and toughness increase when the grain size diminishes. What happens? The strength and toughness increase when the grain size diminishes. Now another molecular forms of carbon has been recently discovered that that has some unique and technologically promising features or properties. Okay, I jump out of NEC Japan in 1991 first announced the synthesis of carbon nanotubes. In his experiments on the arc discharge between graphite electrodes. Okay, in the experiments on the arc discharge, arc discharge between graphite electrodes along the collected shoe particles, there was some fine tube like structures. This on careful analysis reveals that they are the carbon nanotubes. How this did done? It from a person from Japan in his experiment on an arc discharge between electrographites between and along with the uh, collected shoot particles there are some fine tube like structures. This on careful analysis reveals that they are carbon nanotubes. Okay, the short form is CNT, carbon and tube, CNTs. So its structure consists of a single sheet of graphite rolled into a tube, both ends of which are capped with P60 fullerene hemispheres. And the tubes are, can be either open at their ends. These tubes, this can be open. These can be either open at the ends or capped at one or both ends with half a spherical fulvin. You can see in this figure 6, you can see the structure of carbon nanotubes. The A structure is shown as metallic and the B and B and C are like semiconducting. Okay. Now this, this figure shows the representation of a carbon nanotube. Okay, with you. And a nanotube is completely specified by what is referred to as a roll-up vector. Which, intent, which identifies its helical nature and diameter. Okay, what they say? 
this nanotube is completely specified by what is referred to as Lowell factor, which identifies its helical nature and diameter. But depending upon its roll up vector, a nanotube can have either metallic, okay, you can see this figure A, or semiconducting, like in figure B and C, the diagram properties. Okay, this shooting, depending on its roll up vector, the nanotube can have either metallic properties or semiconducting properties. So it will run, it is shown in this way. Now, there are vast ways, vast number of ways in which the graphite sheet can be rolled up. What they say? There are there are vast ways in which a graphite sheet can be rolled up to form a seamless cylinder. And hence, a wide variety of nanotubes exist. So, nanotubes are characterized by the tunnel or wrapping vector, the C vector. So, the C vector refers to any one vector plus M A two vector, where these M A one vector and E two vector are the basis vectors of the graphite. Okay, you can say my own graphite is graphene and two letters and M and N are these integers. Okay. So you can see this in this figure A in the bottom and figure B, C, D in the right hand side. So this is the chiral vector spans. What we say the chiral vector spans the circumference of the tube formed by joining the dotted lines shown in figure this A. So this you can see the figure in the bottom. You can see this there are uh, you can say hexagons made. So what they say that the chiral vector spans the circumference of the tube. Okay, the chiral vector spans the circumference of the tube formed by joining the dotted lines as shown in this figure. Okay, those tubes with chiral vectors of the form M zero are termed as zigzag tubes. You can see this in figure B. This is called as zigzag tubes. Okay, when whereas n equals to m are also called armchair tubes. You can see in this figure C. These are called as armchair tubes. All other values of n and m produce a chiral tube. You can see this figure in the figure D. This is how it works. Okay, this is how it is working. So basically, the thing is that the chiral vector spans the circumference of the tube formed by joint water lines. In this so this you can see this figure they explain the chiral vector. Okay, in the figure A it is shown by dotted lines. Figure B is more like zigzag tubes. Figure C is like armchair. And figure D is like this a chiral tube. Okay. So the relationship between the graphite lattice bases. What they say in this figure? Okay. The relationship between the graphite lattice bases vector that is a one vector and a two vector and the Chiral vector is a C vector. It is used to characterize the carbon nanotubes. So, two limiting cases that are shown at n and a zero indices are associated with zigzag tubes. Okay, whereas n comma n indices are associated with the armchair tubes, like you can see in this. Okay, the tubes are like chiral. So you can see this these three types of nanotubes. One is the armchair, the second and the chiral. Now, closely following the synthesis of nanotubes came from remarkably theoretically prediction that the electronic properties would be changed between metallic and semiconducting simply by varying the tube diameter for its helices. So, key theoretical result is that armchair nanotubes are metallic. Okay, the nano in the nanotube prefix denotes that the tube diameters are in the order of a nanometer that is around 100 nanometers or less. Okay, so nanotube prefix here the tube diameter are on the order of a nanometer. So maybe each nanotube is a single molecule composed of millions of atoms. They say each nanotube is a single molecule composed of millions of atoms, and the length of this molecule is much greater, that is on the order of thousands of times greater than its diameter. Okay. According to the number of layers, this carbon nanotubes can be single walled or multi walled. When you say that this carbon nanotube is from a CNT, okay, and it can be say a single walled or it can be multi walled. So, the in multi walled nanotubes, like in the MWNT, so in multi walled nanotubes, more than 
1C and T carbonyl tubes are coaxially arranged. So IGMA realized that graphite could be bent to form multi-walled nanotubes with different helicities or chinalities which refer to the way hexagonal rings are arranged. Okay, which refer to the way hexagonal rings are arranged with respect to the tube axis. Okay, now what they say here, understand the question. They say that this, the, the scientists from Japan, Aijima, realized that graphite, okay, it realized that Aijima realized that graphite could be bent to form multi walled nanotubes with different helicities or chiralities, which, okay, with different helicities or chiralities, which refer to the way hexagonal rings are arranged with respect to the tube axis, okay. But only with different helicities and chiralities. So it is found theoretically that the electronic properties of carbon nanotubes depend on the diameter and the helicity. In particular, all of the so called armchair nanotubes are conductors, okay, and most zigzag nanotubes are semiconductors. Okay, the armchair type nanotubes, these are conductors. And zigzag nanotubes are like nanoconductors, uh, semiconductors, sorry, semiconductors. Okay, so you can understand this is zigzag nanotubes are like semiconductors. So these nanotubes are extremely strong, stiff, and relatively ductile. So according to the indirect measurements, it has been found that this carbon nanotubes, these are 100 times stronger than steel. What they say? It has been found that, according to indirect measurement, it has been found that. These carbon nanotubes are 100 times stronger than steel and 6 times lighter. This is very interesting. Okay, they say according to the indirect measurements, it is found that carbon nanotubes are 100 times stronger than steel and 6 times lighter. So, for single walled, you can say nanotubes, missile strength ranges from 50 to 200 GPA, approximate order of magnitude greater than carbon fiber. And this is the strongest known. Material. Okay. Now, furthermore, these nanotubes have relatively low densities. Okay. So, on the basis of unique properties, these carbon nanotubes have been termed as the ultimate fiber. Okay. As the ultimate fiber and is extremely promising as a reinforcement in composite materials. These carbon nanotubes also have unique and structure sensitive electrical characteristics. What do you say? These carbon nanotubes also have unique and structure sensitive electric uh, characteristics. So, depending on the orientation, what they say, depending on the orientation of the hexagonal units in the graphite plane that is in the tube well with the tube axis, the nanotube may behave electrically as either a metal or a semiconductor. Now, semiconducting and metallic nanotubes. Recently, are put into use in field effect transistors like in FET and single electron transistors. Okay, SET. We talk about FET is field effect transistors and FET is not single electron transistors. The flat panel and the full color display, that is the TV and computer monitors, have been fabricated using carbon nanotubes as field emitters. So these displays could be cheaper to produce and will have less power requirements. Well, then it will have lower power requirements than CRTs and liquid crystal displays. This is how it can be beneficial. Okay. Now, the mechanical strength of this carbon nanotubes is amazingly 600 times tougher than steel, which finds applications in micro electromechanical systems, that is MEMs, MEMs, micro electromechanical systems, and in aerospace. Okay. MEMEMS. Microelectromechanical systems. Now, progress has been made in using carbon nanotubes as field emission devices, for example, diodes, transistors, etc., for high resolution display systems. So, construction of nanoprobes and electrodes in biological other applications are also being aimed. So you can see this carbon nanotubes are expanding in various fields, maybe in displays of computer monitors, TVs, okay, and they, they have proved that they are cheaper 
okay as compared to other displays available okay moreover its strength is giving its application to lamps and in aerospace okay and maybe in diodes and transistors for high resolution display systems so this is how it is increasing i can see in this figure the structure of carbon nanotubes the a figure is showing a zigzag nanotube b is like armchair nanotube and c is actual or helical nanotubes this is a kind of structures of these carbon nanotubes okay for just for information the structure structures of carbon nanotubes the nanowires okay after this after this nanotubes now we go with the nanowires now this is really interesting topic okay this is an interesting topic and here we can understand that we have to make the show now full resistors and carbon nanotube are hollow so it should be possible to fill them up with different elements and compounds now, introducing a metal inside a carbon nanotube might form a nano wire okay by using electric arc discharge with a metal powder inside the anode what we say using electric arc discharge with a metal powder inside the anode produces carbon nanotube filled with metal carbides the difficulty from the method mentioned above is that the tubes are filled partial this might affect the connectivity properties okay so just found that carbon nanotube carbon nanotubes found the nanotubes could be filled more if we use small amounts of selenium and germanium with electric arc discharge method what they say it is found that nanotubes could be filled more if you use small amounts of selenium sulfur and germanium with the electric arc discharge method moreover there are chemical techniques in which by citric sorry nitric acid treatment okay there are some chemical techniques in which by using nitric acid treatment the tubes can be opened and then materials such as palladium silver gold cobalt iron uranium and nickel oxides molybdenum tin nanodium europium and cadmium can be inserted in their interiors okay so we have this techniques by using this nitric acid treatment you can these tubes can be opened and then materials that such like this can listed can be inserted in the interiors so it is important to know that the enzymes and proteins have been put inside nanotubes okay these enzymes and important to know that enzymes and proteins have been put inside the nanotubes the capillary effects have also been used to introduce elements or they say capillary effects have also been used to introduce elements inside carbon nanotubes okay this capillary effects these have also been used to introduce elements inside the carbon nanotubes such as tin lead bismuth cesium sulfur selenium okay nanowires have been used to prepare ultimate interconnects in integrated circuits also so you can see this nanowires these are used so vast okay so carbon nanocones okay now you can see in the structure how this cone is formed carbon nano now theoretical study is predicted that the formation of graphitic cones in this okay theoretical studies which uh, theoretical studies predicted uh, formation of graphitic cones in this subsequently isolated graphitic cones were produced by carbon condensation on a graphite substrate okay it can be produced by carbon condensation on a graphite substrate and by pyrolysis of heavy metals so more recently single walled aggregates of conical graphitic structures what we say single walled aggregates of conical okay i repeat once again understand things single walled aggregates of conical graphitic structures you see in the diagram have been prepared by laser ablation of graphite tablets so in addition conical structures consisting of other layered materials such as and have also been prepared by reacting boron oxide vapors with multi walled carbon nanotubes now recently it is reported that pyrolysis of palladium precursors okay palladium precursors 
always produce conical nanofibers. An important feature of these uh, new nanostructures is that they are held together by van der Waals forces. Now, since the fibers is composed of an arrangement of stacked cones, okay, what they are held together by van der Waals forces since the fibers is composed of arrangement of stacked cones which can be open or closed okay now these new nanostructures is they say that there is a feature that they are hold together by van der Waal forces since the fiber is composed of an arrangement of stacked cones of which can be opened or closed now it is believed that nanocones may be good electron field emitters and calculations of the electronic properties of Nanocones reveal that there is a charge accumulation towards the tip and there are localized states near the formula. These features, these features just make them useful as field emitters. Okay, towards the tip there is charge accumulation and localized states near the formula. And this feature is making them suitable as field emitters. So nanoscale dimensions, if you talk about nanoscale dimensions, we say that a nanometer like 10 to minus 9 meters as a rule less than 100 nanometers equivalent to approximately 500 atoms diameter. So nanostructured materials may be defined as those materials which are struct whose structural element clusters, such so slides or molecules, have dimensions in the 1 to 100 nanometers range. Okay. Ah, so now we go to the material testing part. Okay. So before the material uh, testing part, we just study about the fracture. In short, so what are the types of fractures? So fracture is a separation of a body into two or more parts under stress. Okay. So the applied stress may be tensile, compressive, shear, or torsion. So fracture is classified in two types, maybe ductile fracture and brittle fracture. When you talk about brittle fracture, you can see in this diagram they say it involves uh, two steps: uh, steep stacking formation and propagation. Okay, it processes involves Two steps is that of formation and propagation. But a mode of fracture is highly dependent on mechanism of crack propagation. You can see the stress strain diagram in this bottom. Now, this brittle fracture takes place without any deformation. Let me say this brittle fracture, you can say, that takes place without any deformation and by rapid crack form propagation. Okay, so in single crystals, the brittle fracture occurs by fracture. Let me say in single crystals. This, this diagram you can see in this uh, stress strain uh, graph is shown to you. So, in this you can see, understand that in single crystals, the brittle fracture occurs by fracture along the particular crystallographic planes. So the failure in brittle materials was caused by many micro or fine electrical cracks in the metal. So, brittle fracture is it may occur in boilers, ships, airplanes, and pipelines. Now, let's discuss about the tile fracture. So it is a plastic deformation in the crack propagation and strain energy required in this is quite high. So you can see in this uh, diagram also there is a stress strain curve and especially for a tile fracture it is given. You can see that there is elastic behavior in the material then there is a yield point then there is strain hardening and after that you have ultimal strength there. and after that the necking will occur and the fracture will take place in this tile fracture. So you can see that in this, you can in the diagram on the left hand side is shown that the tell shear fracture in aluminium and there is steel and how it is better fractured than is in, in steel. Okay, you can see that in the first two diagram where the, the ductile fracture in aluminium and ductile fracture in steel, there is a necking form in between, a neck is formed. Whereas you see in the brittle fracture, there is no neck as it is formed in steel. So you can see this the ductile fracture, you have a neck formation, neck formation, you have a formation of crack, and there is Propagation of crack. Okay, so under tensile load, the neck formation first takes place, and after necking, small cavities are formed, and next as deformation continues, the crack continues to grow. Okay, what happens as deformation continues? The crack continues to grow in the direction parallel to its major axis. So finally, the fracture occurs in by the neck by uh, shear fracture at an angle of 45 degree to a tensile direction. So a factor having this type of the surface encounter is termed as cup and cone. What they say? Cup and cone in this. The cup and cone fracture is taking place because one of the mating surfaces in the form of a cup, while in the other is like a cone. Now, this is a small comparison between ductile and metal fracture. As you all know, 
that is metal fracture and metal fracture these are metal fractures that cause negligible plastic deformation metal fractures that cause with large plastic deformation and the crack propagation rate is rapid in metal fracture and with metal fracture the crack propagation rate is slow and in the metal fracture it follows the grain boundaries and in the metal fracture it occurs to the grains and the metal fracture is a failure due to direct axial stress and the tail fracture is the failure due to shear stress okay so this is, these are like small the differences between the tail and metal fracture which you understand that okay now the fracture of a material by cracking it may occur in many ways like they are like slow application of external loads like tension rapid application of external loads okay the slow applications like tension and the rapid application of external loads like impact then repeated cyclic uh, loading like fatigue and then time and temperature dependent failure under the constant that is three okay so they say that the structure of a material by cracking it occurs in these four ways that tension and impact and fatigue and this three okay so let's study about the structure of materials like first is the tension test compression and the third is the shear load test let's study about the tension test okay so now take about this tension test they say one of the most you can say useful test applied to metallic materials is the tensile test okay what the same is tension test one of the most useful tests applied to metallic materials is the tension test and the test is conducted at room temperatures by applying a gradual increasing tensile load to a standard test specimen okay what the same tension test i repeat understand it one of the most useful tests applied to metallic materials is tensile test okay one of the most useful tests applied to metallic materials tensile test and the test is conducted at room temperature by applying a gradual increase in tensile load to a standard test specimen you can see it in the there is a utm machine in the figure on the right hand side okay you can see that there is a upper jaw seat and there is a the lower jaw seat okay and then you have the lead screw over which you have a working table available this is a small diagram showing the utm machine the universal testing machine okay so to conduct a test here in this we say that the specimen is ripped between the fixed and movable headers of universal uh, testing machine so in this test the load is increasing what they say the specimen is ripped between the fixed and movable headers of the utm machine in this test is increasingly increased gradually and corresponding stress strain diagram is obtained with the aid of instrument attached to the machine what they say in tensile test the load is increased gradually and corresponding stress strain diagram is arranged is obtained by the aid of arrangement of instrument okay attached to the machine now here in this the stress strain diagram for tension test is given so where point a is like proportional limit and you can see that it is the maximum stress at which strain is directly proportional to the stress okay is the maximum stress at which the strain is directly proportional to the stress and at point b you have this elastic limit you can see this is the maximum st stress at which the specimen is deformed without fracture under tensile load you have this point c which is called as a yield point and is the minimum stress at which the specimen is deformed without an increase in load and then you can see there is the the graph is going to point d Which has a tensile strength, and it is said that is the maximum stress that a material can stand, okay, without fracture under tensile load. But as you see that the graph is decreasing and it reaches point E, which is the point at which the fracture occurs. So this is how this stress strain diagram is for a tensile test is taken. Now you have this compression test routine, okay. Now in the compression test, you can see the, how there is a, a specimen that is kept in between, which has a diameter D and a length L. Okay, so we talk about this compression test. They say that this compression test reverses the direction of, of the forces used in the tension test. Or they say this compression test reverses the direction of the forces used in the tension test. In this test, what happens? The stress increases rapidly near the end of the test due to an increase in the area of the specimen. Okay, the specimen selected it depends upon the metal being tested to determine the compressive property of the specimen is usually chosen in which length is 3 times the diameter okay you can see this in the diagram also the length is shown 
Okay, so main thing is that in the compression test, this reverse direction of the force is used in the tension test. Now, we talk about the hardness test. So, it is defined as the resistance to indentation. What they say in this method of measuring the hardness, in this method of measuring, in this method of measuring the hardness of metal is by determining the resistance offered to the indentation. So, normally we have these three kinds of hardness tests. One is the Brinell hardness test, second is the Rockwell hardness test, and third is the Vickers hardness test. Okay. And there are different types of hardnesses like indentation hardness, rebound hardness, skin hardness, cutting hardness, and abrasive hardness. Okay. Let's start first with the Brinell's hardness test. We have seen this, 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 this experiment, okay, this setup. You can see the experiment in our lab also where you have a uh, uh, elevating screw on which clearly we have an anvil and there's an indented okay and you have a hand wheel from which you can lower or heighten the height of this screw and then you have a lever from which you apply the load that is kept at the hanger at the back of the specific of the machine okay and then you have a microscope which is giving you the reading okay now this is a setup of a little harness test you can see there is a, a test piece and there are Two different diameters shown, capital D and small d, and you have a ball indenter on which you are applying the load from the top. So in this, they say that brittle hardness test was introduced by J. A. Brindle in 1990. Okay, this this diagram is now shown in this slide also on the this, this slide. This is a continuation of this uh, brittle hardness test. So brittle hardness test was introduced by J. A. Brindle in 1900. Okay, after polishing the surface, the specimen is fixed on the platform of hardness test. So the test is carried out by pressing a hardened steel or tungsten carbide ball of around 10 mm diameter on the surface of the workpiece. Now a load of around 3000 kg is applied for hard metals and a load of around 500 kg for soft metals. Now BHN, business hardness number, they say that it's given by P upon A, P upon A, then A is given by pi D upon 2, so in brackets then capital D minus and root of capital D square minus small d square. Now here the P, P is the load applied in kg. You can see in the arrow where load P is shown from top to bottom machine. This load applied in kgf, D is the diameter of the ball, capital D, okay, in cap diameter of the ball, that is millimeters, and the small d is the diameter of the impression uh, that is shown in the diagram, you can see. And, uh, it is also in millimeters. Then you have the uh, A is the surface area of indentation, okay. Now the limitation of this real test is like the size of impression is large and is not suitable for hard thin pieces and or case hardened pieces parts and testing material of low and medium hardness. You can do testing of metals of tetrasol metals do, but as having a low or medium hardness, you can go with that. Now this is a Rockwell hardness test. Okay. Now what do you say about Rockwell hardness test? You say the principle of Rockwell's test differs from that of others. That the depth of the impression is related to the hardness rather than the diameter of the diagonal of the impression. Okay. Now, the Rockwell test uses a steel ball or a diamond cone with around 120 degree uh, apex angle. And it has a dial with different scales to read. What do you say? It has a dial with different scales to read hardness number slightly. Okay. Now, in this, if you have a Rockwell, Rockwell B, the scales slightly, you have Rockwell C scales. For soft materials, and you have Rockwell C scales used also for hard materials. It is more flexible. Okay, you can see the setup of this Rockwell indenter. Okay, you have this uh, spherical diamond tipped cone at around 120 degree angle, and you can see the depth of impression shown. Okay, with the arrows, you can see this is the depth of impression, and from which you can apply a load of around 15, 13, 45 kgs. Okay, and there also you can see this depth of impression when you go with a wall. With a cone ball, okay. There also you can see. So you can have this load of 15, 30, and 45 kg. Okay, now let's go next. This is the Wicker hardness test, and they say that this Wicker hardness test is similar to the Brinell test only, with a square based diamond pyramid being used as an indenter. Okay, this Wicker hardness test is similar to the Brinell test. This Wicker hardness test is similar to the Brinell test only, with a square based diamond pyramid. Being used as an indenter. The same as that. you can see in this diagram how this indenter is shown to you. This is the indenter with D as the diagonal. Okay, and uh, the, you apply the force from the top. Okay, and let's just say so 
let's go with the mcqs now because mcqs are also uh, compulsory to discuss okay let's go with the mcqs okay now they say with the advent of scanning probe microscopes which permits observation of individual atoms and molecules it has become possible to manipulate and move atoms and molecules to form new structures and design new materials that are built from simple atomic level constitutes and materials by design i repeat understand this statement with the advent of okay with the with the advent of scanning probe microscopes which permit observation of individual atoms and molecules it has become possible to manipulate and move atoms and molecules to form new structures and design new materials that are built from simple that are built from simple atomic level constituents so what is this called material by design so i think it's true he is the answer so nano structured materials may be defined as those materials whose structural element clusters whose slides or molecules have dimensions in the 1 to 100 nanometer range it's true he is the answer now clusters of atoms consisting of typically hundreds to thousands of or nanometers scale are commonly called as nano clusters so these small groups okay what we call these are called as nano clusters clusters of atoms consisting of typically hundreds to thousands on nanometer scale are commonly called as nano clusters and these small groups of atoms in general go by different names such as substantial work is carried out in the domain of nano structured materials and nano tubes in the past one decade so i think it's true a is the answer the graphite structure is composed of layers of hexagonal arranged carbon atoms in the layers each carbon atom is bonded to three coplanar neighbor atoms by strong covalent bonds by strong covalent bond so i think it's true a is the answer okay by strong covalent bond a is the answer true okay i have discussed this structure in, in our slides also you see this graphite structure is composed of layers of hexagonal arranged carbon atoms within the layers each carbon atom is bonded to three coplanar neighbor atoms by strong covalent strong strong covalent bonds this diagram also i shown to you okay is the answer true are other types of nano structured materials which has been considered for applications in opto electronic devices and quantum optic devices are nano sized powders of silicon silicon nitride silicon carbide and their thin films but true is the answer true is the answer now some of these nano materials okay this after this you can say some of these nano materials for example silicon carbide and silicon nitride are also used as advanced ceramics with control metal structures because their strength and toughness increase when the grain size diminishes true a true it is true a is the answer now each nano tube is a single molecule composed of millions of atoms the length of this molecule is much greater than its diameter so i think it is true answer is true a is the answer so the electronic properties of carbon nano tubes depend on the diameter and helicity in particular all of the so called armchair type nano tubes are conductors and the most zigzag nano tubes are semiconductor true a is the answer these carbon nano tubes are 100 times stronger than steel and 6 times lighter obviously true a is the answer now on the basis of unique properties on the basis of on the basis of unique properties the carbon nano tubes has been termed as the ultimate fiber and extremely promising as a reinforcement in composite materials these carbon nano tubes also have unique what these carbon nano tubes also have unique and structure sensitive electrical characteristics okay i repeat understand it these carbon nano tubes is known as cnt in short form carbon nano tubes is also have unique and structure sensitive electrical characteristics so i think it's true the so answer is a true is the answer a here are the references which you can refer and increase your knowledge in these topic and if you obviously increase your knowledge by reading these books with the references which you can refer thank you all